And I want to welcome you again. And uh, so we'll say a few words, and then you get your main speakers today or tonight. I uh, want to talk a little bit for a minute about the WIP, the Whitehead Research Project. If you probably have Googled it in the meantime or so. So it was founded like 10 years ago. So this is the 10th year. But it's only the eighth conference. So I think I have to go another two conferences and make it 10, and then move along somewhere else with other stuff. So eighth conference, and it's our pleasure to have uh, Ed and Brian here tonight, and all of you coming with them with the plane, I guess, many, the same plane even I've heard, talking over all the you know, all other people. So uh, they are missing here right now. WRP uh, was kind of willed into existence. It's a very small enterprise. It was mostly held up by you know, uh, students, uh, PhD students, who most of them have moved on in the meantime and uh, have become their own uh, capacities somewhere. And it was also only funded very little. And we're still, so we just, it's not a lot of money behind it. It's just will and, and interest. And so over these 10 years, we put, make some things reality that we didn't think would happen. One is we could go on with these conferences and had very interesting ones, mostly related to postmodern thought about you know, why didn't Deleuze or about you uh, or, or, or others, but also about Whitehead's late work, for instance, and, and ins you know, installations of why it's work in this way. And we could produce books of all of these conferences, so they're all published. We'll see how this goes, and then we talk about that. We also produced a series, uh, the Contemporary Whitehead Studies, which is not identical with, with the conference. And uh, one of us here, uh, Brienne, I just saw her. Here, right, has recently published with it, the series, for instance. And this is an ongoing project. So if you are interested to publish something on Whitehead, uh, there are criteria there, and you can send your manuscript and, and so on. But we're mostly interested in Whitehead's work, Whitehead's text, but also in reaching out towards postmodernism, but also to something more American, which is uh, uh, analytic philosophy, uh, and also East-West discussions, so a wider context of philosophy. Uh, and besides that, I think we are very happy that we could, after 10 years, and needed really this time, uh, bring to the foot uh, the critical Whitehead edition. So all of the works of Whitehead we published in a critical way. Uh, and uh, we are just on the way to really get the first book out after 10 years, after clearing up all the legal stuff in doing this and to be able to get interesting editors for these projects to find all the materials that are still not published out there. And we'll begin with uh, the kind of notes of lectures that Whitehead gave in Harvard in 1925. So that's the beginning. And, and if all goes well, then the next conference, you know, next December, first December weekend will be about this, the new insights in, into these unpublished materials. And that could be quite interesting. So. With that said, uh, I will hand you over to Joe Pedic that you had contact with, who is the wizard here, the wizard of WRP, mm -hmm. and uh, also very much working with uh, Critical Whitehead Edition, and also organizing uh, this conference on the floor, and he will give you some insights that are needed in the future for this conference, organization of it. Yeah, so I'm pretty much the main logistical guy, so if any of you guys have any questions as the conference goes on of logistical nature, then do ask me and I'll be happy to help you. Uh, just to note for the meals, the three main meals of breakfast, lunch, and dinner, those will all happen across the hall at the Lemon Tree. It's literally just through those double doors there. Uh, the break meals of coffee breaks and stuff will be generally set up in the back of the room here. Uh, the, all of the meals for paid registrants Paid registrants are included except for the dinners, which are only for invitees uh, and invited Sense Lab members and speakers. Uh, as far as the talks go, I just wanted to note that we do want to have a maximum amount of discussion possible. So try and confine yourself to uh, 10 minutes if possible. We 
might allow up to 15, but we'd really like to avoid that if possible. Um, and the one other logistical note I want to say is if you do have a PowerPoint or a video or something, please be sure to talk to me about you know, half an hour beforehand during the break for it to make sure that we have everything set up and that we don't spend a lot of time trying to get that stuff working when we want to be in discussion. So I think that's about, about it. Wonderful. Can we give him a hand? Because he's awesome. Oh, absolutely. Hi. Michael, mm -hmm. find Michael. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> also co-organizing this conference, uh, like Joe. Okay. Right, it's your job, right? right. So, and and definitely you got a job now. But I want to say I want to I want to say that uh, like one and a half years ago was the the, the tenth whited conference here at Claremont Inn after many years, and so we were all engaged in some of these groups and and, and sessions. There was a lot to to do, and but. Uh, you headed some kind of was it track or something? Social line. Tracks and, and Social line. You had a whole, you're not a track, you had a whole, what was it called? A Two whole, days. Yeah. Panel. Okay, your panel. <laughs> so, I, like, I had like five panels to go to and, and stayed there around. And he said, if there's anybody else you want to go to or should go to, then it's the, the two of them. So, so visit them, I did, and I was just amazed by your way to go with Whiteheadian practices, as I, I call it. And I asked you right away whether you would come, and you said yes, and, and you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, so uh, about 25 minutes ago, I was asked to introduce Brian and Erin, um, which I'm now going to do. I'd like to say, rather than co-organizing this, I think it's my fault, because I did ask Roland to come and see Brian and Erin. Now, for most of you, uh, Brian and Erin uh, don't need any introduction. For those of you who don't know, I don't say this very often, and you're not meant to say it in academia. Um, if you don't know their work, then you should. So uh, I'm not going to do one of those things where you read out all the stuff they've written. You can do that. We've got computers, so you can go and find out <laughs> what they've written. So go and read it. Now, I've seen you before. Now, you won't have known it. I've been hanging around at a place like Goldsmiths when Brian came and talked on abstract and color once many moons ago. I was doing my PhD. Okay. I, Things like that. I, I'm not going to go too far because the academic writing is only part of it. And actually, in terms of the sense lab, which I think we're going to get more of a sense of over the next couple of days, <laughs> uh, I think I'm not going to talk for you, but the idea that writing and thinking involve other things, which include learning, creating groups, stuff, which again isn't for me to declaim upon, but for us to find out over the next couple of days. So. Do you know what? I'm going to stop at that. I think that's all you, we need to know so far. So let's find out what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> the conference is now in. <laughs> We're not going to tell you. <laughs> that's for us to, to do together. Uh, we just wanted to uh, sort of just set, set some ideas in motion around uh, the proposition. Uh, and uh, talk, I'm starting about talking. Can everyone hear me? Is my voice carrying well enough? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, yeah, we're just talking, talking about the, the motivation of the kinds of experimentations we've been doing at the Sense Lab to begin with, uh, and that we wanted to, to bring here and see how it could play out uh, differently in another situation. And it's basically the context of the uh, sort of continuing neoliberalization of the university where the, the figure of the professor has become more and more that of an employee of a corporation rather than any, any kind of uh, uh, figure that could have uh, an importance in, in the public sphere, a kind of potentially public figure. And the figure of the student has become more and more a figure of a client. Um, and so, so within that model where we uh, are becoming more and more managed and the classrooms more and more organized and uh, in a lot of uh, the contexts that some of us work in, uh, much, much more um, uh, homogenized and regularized in, in the way in which it has to function, um, the, the way we think about what knowledge has changed a lot. Uh, under the uh, pressure of the 
idea that knowledge is something that already exists as acquired and then is transmitted. And that creates, in that context, it makes, uh, constitutes as a kind of capital that's uh, held in, held by the professors that constitute their human capital and their, their ability to um, present themselves on the job market that, and to embody a certain kind of value and then on the side of the students. It's, the, it's a kind of promissory note of uh, skills, of especially accreditation, that they, we have convinced them that they will be able to use uh, to develop their own human capital and, and uh, status on the, on the job market. Um, so when, when you came last year, um, Brian and I were thinking across Nietzsche and Whitehead trying to parse uh, politics of affirmation across the two thinkers in relation specifically to the question of, um, what was it, double? Um, double affirmation. Yeah, double affirmation and beauty. And we were, and when Roland asked us, uh, he said, it's like you're, it's like you're doing a, a laboratory for Whitehead. Mm -hmm. And we said, yeah, that's what we do. That's exactly what we do. And so our background, uh, we've mentioned the Sense Lab a few times. I started the Sense Lab in, in 2004. I called it from the beginning a laboratory for thought in motion. I was afraid uh, I had, I came from a very anti-institutional background and I got a job in a university and my father cried. And, uh, <laughs> and so I thought I need to surround myself with people who are who want to think at the edge of what is thinkable. And so I, I sent out a call, you, you know, are you interested? And there was a lot of interest. And so, so even though I started the Sense Lab, the Sense Lab is not me in any way. It was, a, it was, a, it was before I knew Whitehead, it was a proposition. Mm -hmm. And it returned to me um, with stakes that became more and more and more complex and interesting. The stakes that we're working with right now, 15 years in, are uh, the project of the Three Ecologies Institute. And if you read the proposition, you'll see the Science Lab is working toward an alter university, an unaccredited free um, environment for thinking and learning that doesn't, that needs to learn what that can mean. So when we're talking about an alter university, we don't really know its form. We've been, we're slow. We've been thinking and working hard for three years, so it's not, it, these kinds of questions take time. So when Roland said to us, would you like to come back? We thought, this is perfect. We need other people to help us think this, and we don't know anybody <clears throat> who can do this better than Whitehead. So Whitehead has been the force of our laboratory at the Sense Lab for this period of time, in part because this may seem strange if you're not an artist, but Whitehead is the perfect thinker for artists. And most of the people, at least the majority of the people who come through Sense Lab have a relationship to art. And the idea of process is so much part of how they understand the world that the connection to philosophy um, has been more intuitive than with a lot of other forms of philosophy. So through Whitehead, other forms of philosophy have become thinkable. And so what we're doing today uh, and tomorrow and the next day is wanting to ask with you what is a Whiteheadian laboratory and how can it become a Three Ecologies Institute? And we hope that at no point do you think we know what we mean by that. So it's not that we've got like the secret and we're waiting for you to unfold it with us. We don't know, is it a site or is it a proposition that, that has to be part of every environment for thinking and learning? Um, all we know is that a thinking in motion has to happen and it's, it, it's, it's that thinking in the act that the university is trying to close down. And in the way that, that uh, knowledge is construed within the university, it's basically in the, in the declarative. It's something that is thought to be able to be, uh, be well encapsulated in uh, a proposition in a verbal sense. And Whitehead's proposition goes way beyond that to include uh, nonverbal uh, registers. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we decided to uh, organize it around the, the notion of the 
proposition because it's been a part of our practice from the very beginning to try to explore uh, how we can work across verbal and nonverbal linguistic and materials or movement based practices and create a kind of uh, sort of a kind of kind of emergent value from from that gap between them. Um, so we thought that it would be interesting to sort of ask ourselves what it would mean to make ourselves propositional in the context of the conference genre, which uh, paradoxically means that we're going to be mainly using language. So we want to, <laughs> we to talk about that. Um, and then, so we thought we'd just go through uh, some of, the, some of the, the main issues that I think will be suggesting themselves uh, during the yeah, I wanted to just say, oh, well, I'm actually interrupting when he's going to say it anyway, but we, we wanted to foreground six things. So what we want to do right now is put you in the posture of a certain kind of listening with the hope that this ends in a conversation. So what we're going to do is we're going to foreground six, uh, six things, let's say, six aspects of process and reality, six, six, six aspects to the proposition that we think could be key to the next few days. And in each case, we're going to do it in our language. We went, we, we, you know, we, could, we were afraid of, that we might go too much into the nitty gritty. So we're, we're going to stay away from the nitty gritty of the proposition in order to give a wider view in the hope that the nitty gritty moves back through. And in each case, we're going to give you a problem and one way in which the Sense Lab has address this problem. At no time should you assume that the sense lab knows what it's doing or, or you know, has it figured out. It's not that way. But working propositionally is working as much with the failures, as we know, as with the successes. And so, and so every time we've cut through one of the problems that we'll raise, it's created another problem. And so we're hoping that by, <coughs> by foregrounding these six ways of thinking it, we can then move through and 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 you know use this hour and a half to think together about these problems. And that generating more problems from the problem is, is also a very Whiteheadian movement because mm -hmm. he talks a lot about how propositions uh, set forth certain uh, potentials in the world that uh, are capable of being reformulated in in terms of more generalized <coughs> propositions, and that I think is sort of an infinite generativity to the proposition so that the emphasis shifts from product in our current way of looking at knowledge in the university to the process of the production of knowledge ending up in what he calls new, new forms of life, new individualities. The six things we wanted to talk about um, were language, contrast, decision, the subject of the process, and the collectivity of the process, because we're convinced that the individuality he's talking about is a collective individuation. And then finally, value. And uh, Aaron said that we weren't going to be, we we're going to be using young words, but actually starting with quite nice words. That's true. <laughs> there are times yeah. when you need these words. So the first one is language. And so you know when we say six, we're coming to an end, if you have an attention span of mine. Okay. So the first one is language. We're gonna we're just gonna pull uh, a few quotes from Whitehead here. Um, page eleven, process and reality. All of this is from process and reality. It is credulous to accept verbal phrases as adequate statements of a proposition. Page thirteen. No language can be anything but elliptical, requiring a leap of the imagination to understand its meaning in its relevance to immediate experience. No verbal statement is the adequate expression of a proposition. So there's, there's an excess over the uh, semantic meaning, the logical content of language that is a part and parcel of the proposition and has to do uh, with modalities of immediate experience that already suggests a recentering of how we think the classroom might be able to function, which is anything but in the mode of immediate experience, but in a very mediated, uh, indirect mode of, of listening and attention. 
And, and one of the problems, and I don't know if we share this, it depends where you're coming from, but one of the problems that was at the heart of the sense that when we began, and this is not the problem of mine, it was that um, a, a new uh, category of funding, the Canadian uh, academic world is very grant uh, oriented, so we get a lot, we, we, we require to write grants and we fund our students through grants. So um, the new category had come in called research creation. And research creation is what Canada calls what Europe and Australia might call um, artist, art-based practice, 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 uh, practice, practice research, research or art-based research. Yeah. And so as that category was coming into existence, it was really parallel to the science of coming into existence. And we felt very strongly in the early years that we needed to take that and pull it away from creative capital. We saw what was going to happen, um, which has happened, um, which was that the um, the university would figure out that it could make money off of art, and it, so it would bring the artist into the academy, um, but it wouldn't create the conditions for assessing value in any other way than it already knew how to do, which is linguistic. And so this has been a problem across, in different ways across different um, educational systems. It plays itself out differently in, in Australia and the UK than it does in Canada and Europe. But overall, the question of evaluation became key. And I'm saying this because in relation to what Brian was just saying, what we did was we said, yes, art is a mode of thinking in its own right, and thinking cannot be reduced to language. But we also said philosophy is a mode of uh, creative activity in its own right, and it cannot be reduced. Mm -hmm. And so, so this was, this is perhaps a place to begin the, the, the problem of language, to think, you know, when Whitehead says that language is just a series of squeaks, mm -hmm. but he writes many books, we <laughs> have a sense well, that he's a lot of language. <laughs> so, um, so, so the problem uh, that we, that we're foregrounding here in relation to language is that education makes, makes language or makes the verbal the measure of knowledge and values it above other modes of knowing <coughs> that are nonverbal. Or, yeah. Yeah, and that came out even, even with this introduction of the category of research creation. About 15 years ago, when I first started talking about it in my own department, it went nowhere because they said, we don't know how to evaluate it. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're, not, we're not artists. And on one side, the evaluation that, that, that the universe was looking for was feeding into the creation of capitalist surplus value, which is a quantitative kind of, of value that feeds culture industries, that creates new systems <coughs> or products or new content for the culture industry. So, but that was outside the purview of what you're evaluating when you're evaluating and, and that you're a PhD. Um, so they were comfortable with the verbal evaluations, and I think that has carried over where people have find it very difficult to evaluate a non, the, the, the creative aspect that's not in language on, on its own terms or in relation to the verbal, and they want, every, they, they want to be able to evaluate this, but the nonverbal side, uh, side only. And the other side of that, which you'll see, I know we have folks from the Chicago Art Institute here, this might be more familiar to you, although it seems like a good place in this regard, but the other side is that the that there's been a big backlash from the side of art, which has um, continued the work, particularly in North America, of refusing thought uh, that works in language, and, and operating with thought only in the, in the framing of art. So in these stages where art gets brought into the public sphere through an artist statement or through a catalog essay, but refusing the idea that, that philosophy is a companion to art that remains dissonant, but productive in its dissonance. Yeah. And so these both sides are pushing up against one another. And so the Sense Lab has worked really hard for 15 years to be become familiar with dissonance and to become acquainted with modes of collaboration that don't try to resolve it, um, that develop patience in relation to it. And I can say that this is deeply uncomfortable um, because the modes of encounter of material practices are so many 
and and they they have different techniques, they have different rhythms, they have different durations, and they have different modes of editing. Um, and but what we know for sure is that a strong philosophical reading will not make an artwork work, and a fantastic artwork won't make, you know, these are these, these have to retain their difference. Mm -hmm. And so we've worked really hard to carry that difference with rigor on both ends. And to create a kind of synergy between them so that, so that they're feeding each other without reducing the, without reducing the difference. So, so we're bringing up the, the sort of non-verbal registers and uh, practices, practices that don't, uh, in which language doesn't sound like that. No. What does this mean? <laughs> this is the moment when you realize this was never us speaking, that there were 20 other people in the room and 50 other people who were running this show. Well, the visual came out from underneath the words. But, uh, yeah, so it wasn't at all to, to devalue language or put it into an either or. In fact, it's just to suggest that we can use language otherwise. Uh, and the, the, the first um, exercise that we'll do, the conceptual speed dating, is a, think, a way of trying to give a real, a sort of immediate sense that there's a thinking through language that isn't necessarily contained only in the, only in the verbal uh, formulation itself. Uh, that can involve a very collective process. And that leads us to number two, contrast. Um, contrast has been a, a really key concept for us um, because what we're talking about is the dissonance is really where we've taken the concept of, of contrast. So, so the proposition, as we understand it, is a mode of relatedness holding a complex of contrasts together toward a hypothetical future bringing that futurity into the present as a constitutive factor that is immediately felt. So, um, and Whitehead often uses the word contrast in the singular, but it's almost always clear that what he's talking about is a complex uh, of contrast, and that it's quite a, a fairly rare um, limit case that there would be a contrast between two things. So basically, he's talking about complex patterns and uh, different sort of gradations of, of emphasis and of uh, evaluation. And um, that there's also in a proposition as it suggests itself and makes itself felt in the primary phase of an occasion and the welling of, of an event uh, includes uh, a great number of uh, sort of alternative paths uh, and um, uh, different modalities of experience and different uh, potential futures held together with their differences intact. And uh, that the, the playing out of the proposition that uh, resolves itself into the sort of integral unity of an occasion of, of existence is a kind of integration of those differences that leaves the differences in place and active, but as a, uh, a level of sort of global uh, encompassment, a global embrace of them that creates a particular kind of a pattern that represents uh, a set of potentials. And in this, in this few days, uh, contrasts will be key. And uh, later on, we'll talk about a figure that we're going to propose. Um, and, and we thought you know, we could make an infinite list of what we imagine contrast could be, but definitely the contrast between the future and the past, contrast between sense modalities held together in their difference, qualities of attention and affective tones. We worked a lot at the Sense Lab with neurodiversity and thinking about different forms of attention and different qualities of participation, and also between human and, and non-human forces at play, which is one of the reasons why it has been so important to us. And, and of course, the, in all of these, the incompossibilities or the, the incommensurabilities and how they play out. In that first propositional flush of a movement, uh, there's a great number of things that are incompossible that are not going to be able to be, to be integrated without being, without being eliminated. 
uh, which means pushed background. Um, uh, so, it, so the proposition is a kind of dissonant uh, entity, it's a kind of dissensus. And uh, as Whitehead talks about when he's talking about beauty in the in, in religious of ideas and the, the role of, um, uh, of disharmony, that the, the creative aspect requires holding on to that dissonance, holding on to the dissensus, because that is like a reservoir of potential for a new valuation. And a, and a new creation of, of potential later on. So, so we really uh, try to hold to that that dissonance as a positive, and that consensus as a positive condition. So the problems you can by now you'll figure out what the problems are. That traditional education assumes that knowledge is the resolution of these kinds of incompatibilities. Yeah, that they're already pre-resolved by the time by the time they have been constituted as knowledge and are ready for transmission. And so, um, Science Lab works from the perspective, uh, the way we think of our work is developing techniques. Techniques, in, in the way we understand it, um, are very close to the white Indian proposition. And, and they can fail. And, and you know, over the, over the period of, of our practicing together, and I should say, the Science Lab has no membership. It's completely open. So. It, it, it shifts, but, but propositions have the capacity to work across um, membership. So, so something can be seeded and can grow for years and years um, and can fail and fail and fail and then, and then find a direction. And so, um, so the techniques that we've built um, are modes of experimentation with, this, with the question of how to um, carry contrast how to create the conditions for contrast to be um, lived with, let's say. Which, which includes, in our case, a lot of, a certain kind of affirmative duplicity. Um, because we understand that we're working, a lot of us, within rules and within systems and within structures that don't necessarily favor these kinds of contrasts. So a lot of the, the work, it would, be, it would be false to say that we work in an anti-institutional posture because we're fully aware that we're operating and, and in, at the moment benefiting from the institutional structure as well, in part because the institution attracts really interesting people. And also because right now we're operating with a really large grant. <laughs> and and so, so, the, so we're never, our eyes are, are never shut to, the, to, the, to that contrast as well. So we try to work with, with all of those levels and think across them to, um, that, could be, that could be the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's, bring that forward, so. <laughs> and, and so this is, you know, later on when we talk about the Three Ecologies Institute, this is a key question. You know, we're not moving out of society, we're not moving out of capital, we're not moving out of institutions. Anything we create will, will maintain a, a, the status of the parent institution. So what is the para? How does it work? And what can it propose? And what can it do? And what can it not do? And under what conditions can it do what it does? And these are the kinds of questions that we're very obsessed with. Yeah. So the para institution is a certain kind of complicity with the working with without being subsumed by, rather than a straightforward oppositional anti-institutional. Yeah. Although we can be anti, but. <laughs> <laughs> so that leads us to number three. Number three, which is decision. Um, so the practices that are implied by this are, are basically improvisational because, because the, the outcome, although it's operating as what Whitehead calls a door for feeling, uh, it hasn't been given definite character yet. It hasn't been fully determined. So it's orienting, but at the same time, vague. Um, but improvisation doesn't mean, I think I'm sure that anyone familiar with improvisational practice or has done it, doesn't mean because anything goes, it's a highly, I mean, highly complex preparation and setting of conditions go into a successful improvisation. And so that's one of the aspects of decision. So one of the things we did early on with the sense of it was the first thing we did was we said, we rejected two forms. One of them was the conference and one of them was the exhibition. Um, and we rejected them. And the artist's talk. And the artist talk, yeah. And we rejected them partly because we know we knew the world would continue to invent them, but they didn't need us to do that work. 
And partly because we felt we needed to find a way to come together that wasn't in the mode of self-presentation. Um, and, and so in, in relation to this question of improvisation but not anything goes, or, or improvisation and, and technique, what we did was we asked people if they wanted to come together to share their techniques. And so we take this very seriously, that, that everybody who comes to work with us um, brings all kinds of ways of knowing into the mix. And we are absolutely starving for those ways of knowing. And the way we work with that is by refusing any model of introduction. So if you come, if you arrive at the Sense Lab, you won't be presented. Because what we want to know is what your techniques are. And sometimes when you go into the mode of self-presentation, it, it backgrounds your techniques because you're presenting only in one way. So we're really curious to see whether, whether by coming in, some kind of modes of knowing might resurface that you'd forgotten about. And they might come into play. And so for that reason, we don't separate out in any way people with an artistic practice and people with a philosophical practice or with a biological practice or with a engineering practice. We work just at the level of what we're trying to work out, and we work with anything we have. And um, so decision has been really key in that, in that yeah. regard. So, so part of that is setting in place the conditions, uh, putting a lot of attention on how people cross the threshold together into the event, because that primes participants uh, towards certain kinds of behavior, certain kinds of assumptions, certain kinds of modes of attention. Uh, so we set place what we call enabling constraints, which are rather than framing a discussion or framing an issue, we think of it as a platform of a springboard that allows people to jump off together. Um, and we also, and this, you know, we speak about this with some certainty, which is false. I mean, we've had enough time to be able to sort of work out what has happened. It's not that we knew that this was the way things were going to go, but one of the things that has been most interesting, I think, to all of us is, and we've only realized it in 2011, so we've been working together since 2004, so it's a long time, uh, seven years, I guess, and we realized we had completely adopted a white hidden mode of decision, which is to say that we have no practice of consensus. We have no meetings to discuss what we're going to do. We don't have any operations that would decide that something would be better than something else. We operate with appetite. So a process moves, and it goes where it goes, or it doesn't. If it doesn't go anywhere, well, it just doesn't go anywhere. And another process is seeded. Nobody discusses which processes should be seeded. They just get seeded. And so in, in the earlier years, we could have months without anything being seeded. Right now, things have taken on a quality of speed, where many processes are being seeded daily. You know. so, so now we're in a different phase where there's absolutely no way for me to participate in everything that happens, which is fantastic, because it means that a new level of decision is happening that is happening transversally. So things are happening across. You may be infected by a process you never participated in, which can, which can alter what can happen in another environment. And uh, so what we realized was that, um, that decision, uh, if the conditions are set right, if the techniques are in place, decision can actually operate with an ethics of concern, which is for us what we take as the heart of the Whiteheadian approach. Concern for the event, not a concern for the individual, but a concern for the event. So if the practice is doing its work, then that little bit of the uneasiness when nobody participates in whatever you see that can be cast aside because something is actually happening. And that seems to have worked out by itself without needing to be sort of foregrounded. Yeah. So, so if the conditions are well constructed and enabling constraints have been put in place to create a propositional field, uh, there's a kind of what, what um, Whitehead calls a flash of novel novelty, a certain suggestion of a of a lure that orients a subjective aim. But because the conditions have been set in place to activate people's participation differentially, uh, and everything happens across those differentials, 
rather than from one person to another in a kind of uh, column, sort of action reaction or in, sort of interactive model. That the the that subjective aim uh, really hits at the collective level. It's a kind of sweeping up of everyone into a certain movement together. So when, when, so it sort of clicks, or it doesn't. More often than not, it doesn't. But it, but but it does. It does happen, and uh, that's sort of the second decision. It's that kind of immediacy of the clicking place of um, of, a, of a collective movement toward uh, toward an outcome, which will be some some taking form, but what form is not pre-decided. So this is the problem: is it doing its work? And uh, and the work, as we understand it has very little to do with what's happening right here on the ground. It has to do with the capacity for the process to seed something forward. So can it create a nexus of occasions? Can it, can it do the work of a proposition in the way that brings appetite, novelty, creativity into the world? Understanding, in the Whiteheadian sense, creativity is a, is, is a reorientation that, that um, alters how thinking can happen, or, or how practice can happen, um, or how knowledge can be made. And um, so in re relation to this problem, um, there, you know, the, I, th I would say that this is a place where, where, where the sense of still struggles a lot. Um, there's, a, there's an edge to the event um, or to the, to, the, to the process where, which, which would be like the digestive edge of its having worked or not having worked or not having done the work that it could do, which, is, which, which requires its own techniques. And, but it's also usually met with a, with a moment of, of exhaustion. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work. And so, so over the years, this is a place where often things have moved into a kind of collective depression or an anxiety or, a, or a, an uneasiness. And so, um, and I can just give you one example. We had, a, we had an extraordinary event, and I, we've had severe failures, but we had an extraordinary event in the spring last year Called techniques for neurodiversity, where we had some autistics come into the sense of who we've been working with for years, and we read Spinoza together, and we worked together across different modes of attention. It really in the differential. It was it was an experience of contrast, and it was so strong. And then we just fell into a, a hole, like the whole sense of just kind of went <laughs> flat. And I think what was happening was that we 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 didn't know how to continue. How do you make sure after that? that every proposition is neurodiverse. How do you not have to stage an event for neurodiversity in order to do that work? Where do you go from there? And, and so, so techniques need to be created for that. And we've been working with, with trying to think the therapeutic in those terms through schizoanalysis. Um, we have a lot of fantastic Brazilians here with us who have been working with um, Fantastic people in Brazil who are trying to think through schizoanalytic techniques, and so anyway, that, so that's a place also with the Three Ecologies Institute that is that we really feel we have to think together. What do you do um, when the, the 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 capacity for sustaining the appetite feels worn, and, and ha, ha, you know what are the what are the techniques for those moments? Mm -hmm. So so if it if it's if it's working. The decision occurs imminently to the process rather than being applied to it by a decision-making process from the outside. And uh, it, it sort of creates a certain snapping into place of a mode of relation uh, that expresses itself in a movement that sweeps everyone up uh, together in it. And that snapping into place is the cut the kind of imminent decision, or, or could be called a skits in, in the list of the tires, it's a little bit, uh, terminology, so that there are there is a division into befores and afters in the phases of, of the, of the uh, evolution. So, so that brings the next. That brings us to the subject. Which is, yeah. And so working propositionally, it seems to us that cannot proceed as though a pre-existing subjectivity or set of individual subjects entertain the proposition. The collective working out is the subject, and here we wanted to read a few passages of Whitehead's. The, pro the, 
proposition itself awaits <laughs> its logical subjects. Wait a second. 222. The feelings aim at the feeler as their final cause. The feelings are what they are in order that their subject may be what it is. 224. This is the doctrine of the adherence of the subject in the process of its production. So this, the subject is, is uh, imminent to its own self-production, which means if you're talking about an occasion that includes more than one individual human body, it is a directly collective subject. So this is uh, connected to what I was saying earlier about the therapeutic problem. Um, and this is something we've been working really ardently with from the very beginning. That when, when, um, when the proposition fails, um, the personal stakes reappear. And all of the familiar techniques in the institution repersonalize. And, and so how do you create the conditions for, for the, the superject in Whitehead's terminology to continue to do its work? And here we, we work very closely, or we, work, we try to work very closely with, with what we can see in, in the production of subjectivity in Guattari's work around schizoanalysis, around his work at Labol. What he called the group subject. Or the group subject. And, and again, we've, we've, I think we're, we're, we're learning, we're getting better. Um, we had an, an occasion in 2007 where there was a psychotic break. We had underestimated the way in which this kind of thinking could leave you without a ground and um, could leave you without the tools to function. We don't live in a world that functions this way. And one of our students just didn't have the conditions necessary um, both in terms of his own capacity for disintegration or integration and, and in terms of his surrounding social environment. And, and so there was a psychotic break. And what we noticed was that in that break, our techniques weren't yet strong enough. Things personalized really fast. And uh, at that point, I ended the sense lab. Um, Bianca, who's sitting here somewhere, where is she? Wrote an email that said, you can't end it. I'm starting it again, one minute later. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and so the proposition continued. But I think, so I think that this, that this question of, of how, you know, the problem as we see it, how to bring individuals in from the angle of the captivation of the lure so that they're operating in the stream of the proposition rather than from a personal position or a set of pre-established concerns and interests how to create conditions for impersonal intensities. And you know, many of you are in the university, you know how hard this is. How hard this is in the context that we're, feed, we're feeling right now with the election of Trump. How do we deal with this in the context of Black Lives Matter? How do we deal with this, you know, the sense of universal law with activist groups? How do we deal with this when it does matter that you're, that you're being targeted because of how you're perceived as an individual, as an entity, as a, as a race, as a gender, and so on. So, so again, we're, we're working uh, with, with a problem that, that can't be solved, but that needs its techniques to, to maintain its, its contrasts. Yeah. It's a, again, it's not, it's not an either or, just as it was with, with language. Uh, obviously, we, we are constituted uh, as, as persons in the understanding of that within our culture, that we're always recurring to that personhood. Uh, and what, I guess what we're suggesting is that there can be a rhythm of moving from that into a group, development of a group subject, and moving back, hopefully in a way that what we see is the um, sort of the inhibitory aspects of the personal structure, which has to do with mainly with forms of, of resentment, Nietzsche and sentiment. Uh, are, are uh, less activated. And this leads us to number five, almost there, um, collectivity. Um, so we understand the proposition as a condition of collectivity. Um, we love that part in, in the chapter of the proposition where it talks about the number of com uh, complex in relation to the uh, Battle of Waterloo, Battle of Waterloo yeah. uh, but we won't take you all the way through the Battle of Waterloo. But we might say something about it. But we could say something about <laughs> 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 But no, I think I, I particularly love that, that passage uh, because 
he talks about different modes of attention, uh, different positionings of direct experience, and uh, how the sort of the complex of of contrasts of eternal objects of potentials is graded differently by each one. So the proposition uh, of what the, of the, uh, launched by the Battle of Water Waterloo is that entire complex with, with all of those differences in perspective held together, but not being able to actualize together. Um, so, so the conditions of a proposition when it for, it are, are entirely collective. It's, it's a kind of a knitting together of perspectives uh, in their difference. And so we, here we, we borrow the, the thinking of Gilbert Simondon, who emphasizes that the trans individual perceives the individual. And we think the, you know, that, that this is really what Whitehead's proposition is capable of doing, is, is foregrounding how the collective produces its subjectivities, its superjects, its, its subjects. Um, but, it isn't, but it's not the other way around. So what we're interested here in the idea of collectivity is how the dynamic taking form arises, how it becomes an emergent collectivity. And so the, the way that the sense lab works in relation to this is, that, as we said before, that it has no membership. Although it sounds a bit harsh, our, our sense is that it shouldn't matter who is there. Of course it matters. Of course it matters who is in the room. But it shouldn't be, the sense lab shouldn't be defined by those particular individuals. It should be able to carry the proposition so that other other forms of individuation can move through it. Um, and it's been our experience that that really does happen in a way that is quite startling. So for example, you can have somebody seed something. Uh, for example, we, we started uh, questioning uh, gentrification in 2007 in relation to Montreal, and we, we, we developed this idea of a lack of information booth. What would it be to share a lack of information? Not to solve it, but to make more. To, to, to shift this, this, uh, this, this account that the, that the city knows something that it's not telling you, and this impasse between these two forms of knowledge. And we only got a certain way with it. And then suddenly, five years later, it came up, but with a completely different set of individuals pushing that proposition forward in a different way. And we've experienced this often, that that the appetite for something may not get it where it needs to go in one period, but it can be taken up in a different period and go where it needs to go. And so this is how we're thinking about an emergent collectivity. Uh, which is in contradistinction to usual notions of a collective as a, a community. Um, the, the idea between, behind the lack of information is that there, that there are incommensibilities in the perspectives of different individuals, different communities in a city, and yet they cohabit. They cohabit in their difference. And if you have the idea that you can inform each other of your own constituencies, interests, and natures, and somehow it'll create uh, a harmonious community, obviously this has never worked. So we wanted to displace that toward how can we make felt the incommensurability and yet the cohabitation um, in a way that's, that, that, that sort of honors the dissensual nature, but at the same time um, um, welcomes each other's neighbors. And so the, the problem is how to embed this ecological approach in research and pedagogical practice. In particular, how to move from the way the university, in a kind of neoliberal perspective, takes collaboration as its mantra when it's anything but collaboration. And it's the bringing together of finished products in order to employ fewer people. A lot of the time, that's how interdisciplinary plays out. Interdisciplinarity plays out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, how to how to take the risk? And, and we understand what that risk is. It means in 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 audit cultures, which we're not so much part of in Canada, but definitely our our Australian and our UK uh, colleagues are. It means having one less publication potentially because you're you're sharing the process. So how, how, again, how does this kind of creative duplicity work that allows for certain forms of emergent collectivity, uh, or, 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 or is, there, is there a way of bracketing uh, modes of, of experimentation from the takeover of the audit culture? Um, and again, these are open questions. 
in, in um, a recent uh, project, thinking it through, what, what we've been trying to think through is the figure of the para-institutional. So the neoliberal university requires the para-institutional for its survival. Um, and, it, and it understands its creativity in relation to it. So in relation to the artist uh, rent studio, or in relation to the art gallery, or in relation to the, to the um, tech startup, or whatever those pro-institutional, and the, the institution needs them because they're much more flexible than the institution. So it, and, and, it, and it needs them because it attracts creative capital to the university. Um, but of course, um, it's completely um, heavy-handed in the ways in which it takes them up into the university, often, uh, in most cases, killing the potential that was precisely its attraction in the first place. And so how do you, how do you create the conditions, for example, for those parent institutions to retain their flexibility? And one of the very concrete ways in which we've been thinking about this is in the question of accreditation. We mentioned earlier on that the Three Colleges Institute felt the need to resist accreditation. We feel very strongly that a certain kind of academic needs to question the value added of accreditation and the way it plays out in the institution. At the same time, we are completely in, in um, we, we understand the necessity for other formations, such as First Nations, to receive accreditation for those modes of knowledge. So again, it's not an either or situation. And so we've been thinking through how do you create the conditions for a sharing of resources so that the parent-institutional processes of, an, of a First Nations is, uh, university that, that requires accreditation in order to value forms of knowledge that have completely lost um, their value, um, how, do you, how do you hold that at the same time as you critique and, and develop other forms of knowledge that don't require accreditation in the normative sense? So I have six, the last problem was value. Um, and all this is in resistance against uh, notions of the quantifiability of value, and they're predicated on the, uh, the idea, the hope that uh, effective forms of valuation can be put into practice that are purely qualitative. So if the proposition leads to the uh, creation of modes of relate relatedness that bequeath certain potentials uh, to the world, that uh, creation of the mode of relatedness is a kind of surplus value of relation that, um, to, and the value is immediately felt in the constitution of the occasion imminent to, to its occurring. So um, we wanted to try to bring up the idea of value again, which has been not somewhere that a lot of people in academics have wanted to go for a long time because it's, it, it, it tends to immediately raise the issue of judgment and uh, standards and measures of judgment. But Weiffe's theory of value in tandem with proposition really gives us a lot of tools to take value back away from that way of using value towards uh, the creation of novel modes of relation and toward the immediate value of the, of the lived uh, quality uh, of the of relation. So, um, we have a few quotes. On page 280, an actual fact is a fact of aesthetic experience. Oops, I missed the part on aesthetics. Sorry. Well, we'll go to three and we'll go back. Okay. All aesthetic experience is feeling arising out of the realization of contrast under identity. So we wanted to bring this quote before we bring the quote on value. Uh, we have another one. Um, that value for Whitehead is always related to aesthetics. And it's a really interesting um, uh, question. In, in my own work, I've gone to the medieval definition of art, which is manner. And it's really interesting if you go through Whitehead to see how often he uses manner in relation to the aesthetic. And so art as manner, art as way, um, puts art on the side of process rather than on the side of object. And, and so we hope that when we've used art or aesthetics here, it's clear that we're not 
that, that we understand the art market is another institution. So we're not interested in, we're as I'm we're as certain about that, that institution is about the academic institution. But we would like to take back the idea of value in relation to aesthetics in the way that Whitehead is, is, uh, is foregrounding it. So, so his, his notion of, of value is basically on the model of the aesthetic, and, and in particular, color. He always talks about it in relation to color. It's very not what he always comes to. So how do, you, how do you take the sense in which a color has a value and transpose that into, uh, into relational encounters in the context of, of, of uh, creation of new forms of learning? So that's, that's, that's the, the, the question uh, that we have. Um, the, the other way that value comes up uh, in Whitehead, which is important, uh, one other way, is in relation to consciousness. Um, and when we brought up the question of language earlier on, it was in relation to this, this question of consciousness. And we know in Whitehead that, that um, propositions are not um, necessarily conscious, and consciousness plays itself out as a, as a subtraction, the acting of of experience, he says, and in appearance and reality and in adventures of ideas, he's, he's so strong on the question of how consciousness is, is a, a reduction of experience. Um, in my own work with, with autism, I've worked a lot on the question of what I call autistic perception. <coughs> autistics have been accused of being non-relational. Anybody who's worked with autistics knows that they're hyper-relational. The, the thing is that things aren't subtracting out. And so the, the, it's an overfielding of experience. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a lived aesthetics in the sense of, of Whitehead. Um, and so on the question of consciousness, Whitehead says on page 280, conceptual experience does not in itself involve consciousness. Its essence is valuation. So what's interesting for us is it goes back to our original point that, um, that thinking doesn't necessarily that they're, they're, it's conceptual experience. There's, there's thought underway uh, that doesn't take the um, form of reflexive conscious formulation, but does inform it. Um, and that that mode of thinking, uh, that registered conceptual experience, is uh, already an activity of valuation aesthetic in nature. So we put a lot of emphasis on working between philosophy and art practices. Uh, and then in terms of the creation of modes of relation, we want, we want to move that conjunction back into the community and, and into activist practice. So the problem um, is how to affirm this. How to affirm this qualitative aesthetic notion of value and practices dedicated to it in the face of conventional notions of value that quantify it. And here, um, the Sense Lab is working very hard because the problem of the Three Ecologies Institute is also a problem of financial value. And so for um, the last six months, we've been reading um, about derivatives and speculation and <laughs> options and, <laughs> and <laughs> futures. And we're working on a cryptocurrency. We're working to try to think whether we can come up with an economic platform that understands value in the Whiteheadian sense, outside of the service economy, outside of the transaction. So we're working. Um, there's a lot of excitement in the group, and I'm sure <laughs> different individuals will talk, will talk about it. So, uh, during, during the event, but we're, we're, we're working with the group to, to actually create a platform um, that is a distributed autonomous organization, which is kind of evolution from the blockchain, to try to put this into practice, where there would be a kind of economic space of interaction that we would create that would operate on, on purely qualitative uh, post-scarcity principles but at the same time, and this is the part that we keep working on, we're not sure if we'll ever be able to do, but it's the project, we'll be able to interface with other forms of uh, currency so that it actually could be convertible, so that we'll be using our qualitative experience to generate value that could actually then be quantified in order to help us keep working. 
And before you all think we're trick. totally crazy, <laughs> <laughs> we were actually in Silicon Valley two weeks ago. And one of the things that was super interesting, so we went there like this. There were many of us there. We used this vocabulary. And the people who had the money <laughs> didn't need to be convinced. They really could see that there is a necessity for other ways of thinking about it. And they were the ones who came back to us and said, we can translate into the financial vocabulary. We can help you do this. So that was a real shock, because we had been quite cynical. <laughs> and they were saying to us, no, no, no. We understand what you're doing with white You're not the typical people. They're the cool people, of course. <laughs> but so, so again, if, we're, if we want to, so we, we obviously, the Sensor has worked for 15 years in alter economies. We're very familiar with alter economies at the local level. Food, uh, sustenance, events, um, sharing, thinking, creating space, and so on. But there is a question of how to sustain um, a practice um, that includes eating and renting and, um, and leaving the university, which is where a lot of us are situated. And so, and so we're thinking this very, very seriously. And one of the ways in which we're thinking it is to, to become less afraid of the word economy. I mean, speaking for myself, maybe you're not afraid. <laughs> and to think about all of the ways in which value plays out. So the last three years of the Sensar, I mentioned we got a big grant. We, we decided, after many years of resisting any kind of outside funding, to write a grant on the question of value, which we got. We got $3 million to think the question of value. So we've been working really, really hard. And it is from this perspective that we enter in today um, to um, ask you, uh, to, to think with us, the juncture, the knot, and the vector. Um, and we're not asking you in any way to work it out. We hope that the propositional form, these 10, 15 minutes, with a lot of working together, including tonight, will allow us to understand where the knots are in the junctures and where the vectors are in the knots and, and et cetera, and, and how value is created. Um, how the work can happen at the level of the trans individual, and how we might together, for a few days, create a Whiteheadian laboratory. And so, so the figure, yeah, did you wanna? Okay, so, so the figure that we're proposing is a figure that we've been working with. It's another one of those figures that we haven't solved, I think, that we're very good at you know, making problems that we can't solve. And it is what we call the anarchive. I'm sorry, yeah, what? The anarchive. So archive with an A-N yeah, yeah. before it. And this is a problem uh, of the question of value. So when we wrote this big grant, we said we would produce an anarchive. And we understood the anarchive from a very close and obsessive rereading of the function of reason especially the first 30 pages, 31 pages of a function of reason, where Whitehead talks about living, living well, and living better in relation to his very, very weird concept of reason, which we've fallen in love with, and what he calls the anarchic shape. And Whitehead says in the, in the function of reason that, that it, there always has to be a, a, a rebalancing out of the anarchic share in reason. And so we understand that the event the occasion, however you want to call it, carries the anarchic share. And the anarchic share is exactly what the university is, has no time for. The, the university just wants the archive. And it wants us to know the archive in advance. It wants us to know how it will take form. Artists are constantly created in the, I mean, it, it's, it's depressing the degree to which the MFA is about documenting before you've even begun to do anything. And how many times do we ask PhD students to know in advance of what they're doing, what it is that they're going to do? Yeah. And they call that a proposal. Right. So, so over the period of these days, this is what the sense lab is proposing. So what we call the sense lab proposition or keynote or whatever it is tomorrow night is actually not us. We're asking everybody to think, to work with, to be curious about 
where the anarchic share is happening in the event. And we want to capture it, even though it can't be captured, uh, to pull on it. To It could be a sentence, it could be a thought, it could be something that, that, that that, that is in the is in the is in the air. It could be it could be weather. Yeah. So so then so a bit more about the the, the notion of the anarchive. It's related to that idea of the overfulness of the proposition, with alternatives, all of which cannot be uh, thought through, at least at one time. Um, so the proposition uh, sets in place an excess of potential. The anarchive is a way of preserving that excess in a way that it can reactivate to cap capturing, its, capturing its traces. And when it does, it comes back in one of those cuts of imminent decision, which is an acting out of the an anarchic share of that flash of novelty that he associates with the anarchic share. So it's a, it's a way of not documenting, but in, in a sense stockpiling uh, uh, the creative potentials that were, uh, that were proposed into place, but not fully realized. Um, so it's a way of curating the excess of potential. And that's what we want to begin with. And I hope that from here, we can go straight into a conversation. Uh, any entry points, new problems? Yes. Can I say something? Um, Please. Yeah, I, I like to try and keep things simple. I think it's good. I'm British. And I really like the stuff at the beginning about language and position. And just one way of thinking about it is uh, somebody once said in a very general way that you know in the 20th century that language became the problem. And so if you think of people like anybody from Cecile to Virginia Woolf to Russell. To want to pick and find something language becomes the problem which we're trying to extricate ourselves from. But actually one of the easiest ways of extricating yourself is just imagining you, you were in the 19th century, or just in another culture, <laughs> any other point in history, and you would say, Do you know what? There are feelings or something beyond language. And most of humanity, from most of history in most of the world, we just go, yeah, cool. That's fantastic. <laughs> and we're, we're just in a very local problem. Yeah. <laughs> Super. So let's. I mean, it doesn't the absolve us of the difficulties of getting out of it, but it, it's just a way of refocusing it. Just... Anywhere else in the world. Any transitional thought, uh, a quote, a pro another a proposition. Probably this is just you know part of your your motto and <laughs> publicity or sense that which I'm only really just getting a clue about. But that it's more, it's more important that a proposition be interesting yes. than that it be true. Yes. That troubles. And I've been thinking tonight as you've been speaking about the etymology of interesting as inter essay. Uh, being between and thinking a little bit about Brian's animal politics book with strong strong emphasis on on uh, on mutual imminence uh, the white-headed kid concept and uh, a profoundly animal one um, very ludic in the way you develop it but yeah I'm just I'm just getting the texture of what you're doing and it's being so amazingly interesting in the way it's it's provoking new ways of of being, of being between each other. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that leads also to a, the concept we've worked with a lot of imminent critique. What does it mean to not be operating from the outside to critique, mm -hmm. but really living in the, it is more important that it be interesting, that it be true, rigorously. Mm -hmm. And this has been, so we've taken also back the concept of rigor. We want rigor. And some truthful follow up. Yes, yes, yes. So it matters. It matters the manner. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's interesting the way Whitehead, um, because it's more, it's more important that it be interesting than it, than it be true, but in a certain sense, the prop, he also said the proposition is what is being felt. So, so it, it starts from this completely in, indubitable immediate experience of the what 
of an experience. And that indubitability is, is sort of beyond truth or falsehood. And it could include the germs of error or the germs of truth. But that immediate feeling itself is an affirmation that he says is in a more primary sense than affirmation in the sense as opposed to which it's in. Uh, so we try to we, we try to use different categories of affirmation, uh, often connecting them to what the list called belief in the world, which is a very similar and very white heavy concept. Well, the notion of assent to a proposition yes. Yes. is normally the wrong kind yeah. of epistemology yeah. from this perspective. I'll, I'll try and shut up. No, but, don't shut but, up. But getting back to the, I'm not being too technical about the proposition being interesting. Did a few times talk about the proposition failing. And I was thinking, well, it's not, uh, I don't want to use the word blame, but is the proposition failing or was it just so interesting, uh, uninteresting? And if it's uninteresting, <laughs> where does the fault lie? And actually, it lies elsewhere. Not necessarily with yeah. us. Yeah. Or with, with, yeah. So, so we can't blame the, pro if the proposition doesn't fail. That's I mean, true. Yeah. Yeah. Something else is going. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering whether, I mean, he also talks about that lovely quote um, when he talks about um, what the subject can believe as for the proposition, and I can't retain the proposition, yeah. right? And I've always thought about this in, in relation to the shift of white heads on the and things that I've talked about as well, right? Because the, the logical subject won't actually dare to um, entertain white heads rejecting the proposition. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a way in which. I think that's really key, and I think uh, when when it fails, it has re-stratified onto the personal. You know, because often we're, we're working beyond where, where our comfort zone, and we can't follow the proposition, and that's exactly the failure. It's not the proposition's failure in a way; it's our own failure to be adequate to it, or you know. And and so I think about this is one of the key questions with the alter economy, with the with the platform that we're working on. If you, if you fund only what gets a lot of attention, what seems to be working, you're just working in capitalism, right? So how do you create conditions for a sensitivity for what's doing its work in a way that you can't recognize? Another reason it fails is, is exhaustion. Um, because exhaustion. exhaustion. Um, because the, the, pro, the pro, proposition as it's playing itself out is bringing a number of contrasts into mutual sensitivity, it says. Um, but it has to be an attunement to the potential for mutual sensitivity, which is a very intensive mode of being. And I think uh, exhaustion, uh, it's our capacity for attention, our capacity for being that intensively Involved this big limiting factor. Naira has something to say. So, <laughs> yeah. so, does, so does Leslie, I think. Well, and somebody was talking about Anna. Um, I'm, I'm just been thinking about um, when you say proposition, I immediately think lure for feeling. Mm -hmm. And so i um, thinking then too about causal efficacy mm -hmm. and the way in which uh, that feeling arises through physicality. Mm -hmm. And so that idea of mutual imminence, all of that is part of that too, and just the sense of how much of a role our bodies play in, in the way we feel. And so, um, and I'm thinking too of, and this is just all disjointed thought, but I'm thinking too of way that uh, Tillich and others talk about a symbol as participating in that toward which it points. So again, there's that sense of mutuality. Mm -hmm. And so what about the proposition is already present within us? Mm -hmm. And we're just then resonating with what we already contain mm -hmm. or not. Maybe. So, 
I'm just wondering about bringing in the physicality. Totally. Piece of it. And to piggyback off of Sherry, um, I also come in from a neuroscientific background. Mm -hmm. And there, it's, it's unavoidable that you ultimately, it seems like the language that Whitehead is using is almost perfectly matched to the notion of interoception. So our feeling, our internal sense of the physiology and the physiological changes of our body. And so I'm seeing systematic connections between all the terms that you're talking about. And ultimately we do have to get back to a sense of the affective. And so a proposition, I'm hearing um, inferential prediction. And we know now that the brain works in terms of predictive coding, where it's a generative model. So it sends out these propositions, which meet, which interface or contrast with um, sense feelings from your body. The interplay between those two will give a differential, and that differential gets sent back up to you. Mm -hmm. And it's just, the more we explore this kind of notion of propositions and contrast and everything that you're talking about, I really feel strongly that, like what Sherry's saying, when we get back to the notion of the body, we're gonna find this system, we're gonna see this fall into place, and we say, oh my God, what's really happening here? Yeah. And, and how much of this then requires us to think about image versus language? just to interact quickly with that because also uh, by going back to the notion of the body just to think that the body already is also a process and as a process it's also it's also world so it's not that by going back to seeing all these processes in the body we are seeing this process as in a contained environment, but we're actually, how do you see the transversal and the continuum of those processes within a body that is already not a contained, but a relational body? Anna, you had something to say? Yes. Um, well, I was, uh, <coughs> the first point that you addressed is language. And I just, I, first of all, I need to say that I was just amazed to be sitting here and to listen to that synthesis of what we have been doing at the Sense Lab. I think it was amazing to listen to that and uh, to bring back this tension between language, the verbal and the nonverbal, uh, the proposition, how do you make it? Uh, how do you make yourself a proposition? Uh, Brian, you mentioned uh, to curate the access of the event and be an active share. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, since we have been doing this at the Sense Lab, I must admit that it's not easy every day and it might be difficult for you too. So that's normal. <laughs> it's a challenge. It's okay. And what I, so I wanted to address this verbal and non-verbal and just maybe share an experience that I have with that. Um, to work in, in, in this tension, it asks us a commitment. First of all, a commitment to relationality. And uh, since this is a Whitehead conference, I think you might be um, aware of the concept of non sensuous perception. So I think that to commit with relationality, it asks as well an attunement to the non verbal. And we are not used to that. We talk to people and normally. There's so much happening at the same time and we are so much focused on only the verbal. So if you can collect the knowledge that you have about non sensuous perception and just start from there, that's what I do. That's what I try to do in my work and start making a non sensuous perception practice. Maybe that helps. <laughs> At least it helps for me. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I, I really, because um, you were talking about um, practice 
classes and that you're interested in techniques, so I have like a technique to share. And um, so if it's taken up, I'd be interested in how it plays out, or if it doesn't, then um, it doesn't just to say why I come at this um, as, as part of a collective called Formations that has so many resonances with what you've been talking about, or from just having a workshop that like in the end centered around propositions, like our reference for the way that we've been working was around the three ecologies. Whitehead is in there, and so it's like so so exciting for me to, to be here and to, to listen to what you've presented. And um, one thing that um, is interesting to me, or that, that you also brought up, in is like how do you, how to avoid the self presentational stance, and um, I think that's super important and working collectively. And um, and then I was like struck when I saw the program that in the end I'm. If I think about what I'm going to do, I'm self-presenting in a very strong way. I mean, I'm making myself vulnerable and making a proposition and presenting something that is not quite done yet, but the format is somehow it's still that. And I was like, <laughs> thinking about, um, so the, the technique I want to share is like a potential to break that up, and it's, um, it's called the practice of authority. <laughs> and it's, um, maybe some of you are familiar with it because it comes from So I've learned this from an artist that I'm hopefully working with in this uh, in this group. And basically, it's it's based on if you're interested, I can like spell out the, the rules a bit more clearly at some point. But basically, it's giving someone else the authority to speak. So I think we'll have like a lot of conversations, like over dinner or later on. And so um, this practice is like a way of a group conversation that relies on previous. So if I would have like had a conversation with you, you shared something with me, and like in the course of the conversation, I think, oh, that's that was super interesting. But you might not speak up or like share at the moment. I would say, I don't know your name now, <laughs> but um, you said something that made me think about about this, and I'd be super interested for that to be in this space. So it's like a way of like connecting or like opening up spaces for someone else to speak mm -hmm. and so we've been experimenting with that and it has like more technical rules that I can't just like do right now but it's not that easy but it's an interesting challenge and we just tried it out in a workshop um, that we gave and it was interesting because the first people that spoke were like speaking in their own name and we we're like no 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 that's not the rule so we were like more strict I guess this won't work here and it shouldn't be the case but I still thought just as a lot of feeling, I wanted to, to share that as a technique. Um, that's, that's really great. There, there's, uh, there's sort of a flip side to that too, which is the right to lurk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the things we, 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 we try to, uh, at the same time as we try to sort of make that space, that sort of authorization for people to speak, there are a lot of people who aren't ready to or don't want to and or who can't project themselves in that way. And we also we also want to make places for those people to be feel part of the process even if they're not verbalizing their participation. So a lot of our events, when we have our when we organize our events, we often we, we have a lot of embodied practice, a lot of movement and protected propositions, uh, sometimes in the, in the studio, sometimes in the city, we have materials based propositions. And we create different spaces, and we always have like a, a hiding space, like a tent. You know, we have resting spaces, places for people to sit to, when they're overwhelmed, just go and take a nap, just be by themselves. And the, and um, I think we are a quite neurodiverse group, so we don't want to assume that there's a certain way of, although we want, always want to have that option for people to take up, that we don't want that to become a kind of, uh, uh, Imperative. So in one of our events that, that I think really stuck with me, and it was in, in, in Sydney, uh, there was um, an autistic woman who, who came, and, and it was a very improvisational art-based interaction that was proposed by our Sense Lab members. Uh, and she, she came in, and she hid under a table for the entire time her with her dog. She had a um, and, uh, it was fine with everyone. And then at the very end, 
to just sort of stuck your head out and explain to us what our experience had been. And it was just this amazing uh, account of being attuned to everything relation happening in the room from under the table. Um, so, so, so it's, so, yeah, so we sort of wanted to Can I, can I, I that that? Yeah. I mean, I think it's like in the, the Lanterman's bookstore, it's connected to the concept of Akidamento, where they have lots of investment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably difficult to like, like, oh, like it has that danger of like mm -hmm. pointing someone out, but mm -hmm. yes. in a way it's like really based on the trust that we can the trust, have yeah. the conversation mm -hmm. and yeah. say, oh, I think I can I can make that strong yeah. move. That's a strong move. So okay, Laura, like she said something, and yeah, I thought, and you put in, you I yeah. trust that she um, yeah. might want to make that move. Or that yeah. And it's a generosity toward that, that person. To yeah. I could like. Put her on the spot in that way. Yeah, but they're much more gentle ways of doing yeah. it too. To drawing it up, yeah. there's a generosity that enables someone else to to speak, and that's really important. Part. Since we're building techniques, I could build an edge to it, which is because I think it's really beautiful what you're proposing. And I mentioned that we had the techniques for neurodiversity workshop uh, event in March. And if you've ever been around an autistic, if you've been lucky enough, you'll know that they move a lot, uh, especially classical autistic. So this kind of thing would never happen. Um, and there's a lot of stimmy. And uh, so one of the autistics, Adam, um, he would, uh, well, actually both of them, Tito did this as well, but Adam, Adam would, neither one of them can speak. Uh, so classical autism is, has motor issues, which make the voice very difficult. Um, but they can type on the iPad. The typing is slow. And, and in all of the years I've, I've collaborated with autistics, this is, I've seen this many, many times. So, so there's this kind of spur of energy into the typing that has to be let up. And so, and so Adam would get up out of his chair and he would walk around and he would laugh and then he would come back and then he would type some more. And after about two hours, everybody in the sense of was doing this. And like to a lesser degree, but Leslie took all these pictures and you see all these people, they're stimming and, and people are walking around and playing with things. So, so what does it mean to give also the authority to the stimming? Yeah. I was thinking about when you were talking about how, how you the, know? Non, the non sorry, autistic can give us the authority to be in touch with aspects of ourselves. Yeah. 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 I'm assuming people are tired and mm -hmm. jet lagged. Did you want to say something, Anik? Okay, just one little thing. Um, <laughs> you asked about uh, goldsmiths. You asked about why. Um, <laughs> sorry, just, I, I Michael. Looking away, Michael. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> you asked a, a, around why, or, or you were pointing to why propositions fail. And, um, and, and I've been a part of many sense life propositions that have failed. And I think that in, my, in, in different aspects of my experience, one thing that we haven't kind of, I don't think, pointed to is um, the problem that we were trying to address with the proposition. And I think that, you know, we've all been presented with six different problems, um, very, very, very nuanced considered problems. Um, and I think that another reason why sometimes the propositions have failed is because the nuance of the problem hasn't been able to create it, find its space to be heard. Um, <coughs> yeah, yeah, Myra has something. I agree with you, I agree with you. I've had a lovely time, and I'm going to be really, I don't mean to be negative, but I. I am slightly worried, and just treat this as whitehead technicality, if you like. But we're beginning to think about propositions as things. Yes. Which makes them into objects, which makes them into things to be judged by subjects, which get I'm not I'm not blaming you, I'm just saying it just generally. It, it, it's too e it's so easy to fall back, and that's why I've Partly brought up the idea, you know, a proposition is a thing which you then apply the magic form, but it fails, like it's a thing. Right. Whereas to my, you know, the point of a proposition, it is so hard to define because it's something which isn't a thing, an object which can be categorized, mm -hmm. it doesn't fail, it, it can't be seen, you know, uh, uh, it, the blame doesn't 
Then the blame yeah. starts getting apportioned yeah. either to it yeah. or to the people right. in the And maybe, and maybe Myra, this is exactly yeah. what Myra's pointing <laughs> to. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Myra. Yeah. 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 Yeah.